there. All right, so, so what you're seeing here is a picture of two FLIR cameras. And this webinar is brought to you by FLIR because they sponsored it, so I greatly appreciate it. Um, my wife likes it when I can stay home and teach. And I don't know about y'all, but we need more time at home. So what you're looking at is a picture of two thermal imaging cameras looking at the Max Firebox where we did training in West Virginia just recently. And before we get started, I want you to look at these two pictures really closely. Besides the glare on the K65, the K2, which is the inexpensive or more inexpensive camera, the picture's better. And most firefighters would stop right there and say, ah, look at that. That's $1,000. The one on the right, $7,000. That's the one I'm going to buy. But there's more to it than that. So we're going to get into why you should pay attention to certain things and why certain pictures look better when we're outside of fire versus inside of fire and the difference between the two main types out there today, which are situational awareness ticks and decision-making cameras. They're both necessary and purposeful in their proper environment and context. The perfect marriage is to have them both on the fire ground and we'll show you how that works. And hopefully uh, before we all retire that all this stuff's gonna be integrated so we don't have to worry about it. So let's go forward here. So disclaimer, this is not a sales presentation. I don't sell cameras. I help firefighters get the cameras they need, and then I help them understand what they're using and how. You've got a 20-year-old camera or you got a two-day-old camera, we'll help you use it the best of your ability, but we'll also show you one of our, what we believe, the better four that are currently out there because of different features and different benefits and attributes. So I want you to educate yourself and demand better products. Go to the manufacturer, go to the salesperson, go. If your manufacturer doesn't have a way to take information back to them and improve their product, I would highly suggest that you go do business with someone else because they're not planning on improving it, okay? The ones that I really enjoy working with, they have people that go out to live burns and they talk to the firefighters and they ask them, what do you like? What do you not like? What, what are some benefits? What are your pros and cons? You know what they're doing? They're listening and they're taking notes and they're building the next generation of camera based on what you tell them. And that's what's missing. So make sure that's who you're doing business with, right? Because it's for the sake of you and our citizens, right? So a little bit of rock music in the background, but I want to start off with the why. Why do you need this? It will, this is a very short snippet of our introduction to tactical thermal imaging program. Some of you have heard this before, but these are all things you don't or you shouldn't do in a fire. And they all occurred during my training. So I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but my guys. You do have tactical tick use, so you don't do this. You think that hurt? You think he should have checked his pattern? I want this guy. Oh, he's going to his max. Pause the video right there. What's wrong with these two brand new firefighters? Never been in a fire before. First fire they've ever attacked in a 1403 burn. They refused to use a thermal imaging camera. They allowed us to sit in the corner and video so we get extra footage. We promptly left after this evolution. What's wrong with what you're seeing here? I ain't even taught about what we're getting into. What's wrong? Somebody unmute your mic and tell me. What's closed? The nozzle. What's blowing over our head? Thousands heat. of degrees of heat currents. Why do we wait till we're right inside the fire room before we open the nozzle? Is that a problem? Because they can't see this stuff. Does that, does that make sense what we're doing? Because what's happening to the weakest link on their gear? Their face piece is just getting hammered. And if they need that, that thermal protective performance, they need that face piece, it's toast. So here's the issue. Why do you need to know this? The common problem is, is a lack of focus and education on thermal imaging cameras. We are very fundamentally based in sound, which we should be. But the problem is, is we can't see infrared energy. You can't see heat. Two thirds of the fire's heat is delivered in the infrared spectrum, which you and I can't see. So unless we're a goldfish or a snake, 
we can't see it. And the education and training of this stuff and, and the amount of upgrading technologies that has happened, it's all been neglected because all this stuff is moving at lightning pace and we're not getting educated on it. There's no actual certification in the fire service right now, officially, that says if you hold a thermal imaging camera, that you have to have a, this amount of training, this amount of hours, there's NFPA 1801 and NFPA 1408, but if you go work in the industry, you gotta get 32 hours of training before they let you hold a thermal imaging camera. It's a $2,000 class. And then you gotta get 32 CEUs on your own. And then you gotta write two articles in a trade publication for five years. But you know, for us, just write a check, here's your check, have a nice day. I think that's a problem. And here's the other issue. We don't measure heat the way we should. I think that's a problem looking at my, uh, one of my coworkers gear. He felt nothing when this occurred, nothing at all. Our gear is built so well. This, our gear is actually overbuilt. We got one of the highest PPPs in the market other than, than Houston. And we had two propane tanks rupture over his shoulder. And that's what happened. That's why the center of his gear has no damage because it melted the air pack instead. But he felt nothing. So when you feel nothing and it's that severe, you're in a bad place and you don't even know it. And here's why we don't know it. And 38% of all the line of duty desks, guess where the camera was? In the charger of the truck. That's not going to work out real well. He asked a question about liability. What happens when they realize that we could have saved the victim 70% faster if we would have used the issued equipment that has been purchased for us, but we left it on the charger of the truck? Who's going to win that civil or criminal case? The lawyer and the person suing. We measure heat with our ears, our wrist, and with water, all of which are not empirically adequate anymore because they proved in 1967 that 131 degrees is when your TPP is exhausted and your skin receives a second degree burn. And if you try to use your two ears or your wrist or sticking your hand up in the smoke at 140 degrees, your pain receptors are turned off. I'm pretty sure we fight fire above 140 degrees. So if you're gonna to try to use your body as a thermometer, it quits working at 140 and skin is destroyed at 162. And the issue with that is, is a human victim laying in the floor that we're afraid of steaming, if they breathe 180 degrees for 20 seconds, their trachea seals up and they're dead. If you're hurting in PPE, they can't take it in pajamas. And we're not measuring heat. We're not doing them any justice by not addressing this problem. The other issue is the ticks whited out, which is the information was ignored, older ticks, they used to white out. You, they would look up, they'd see too much heat, and the whole screen would go white. And they would ignore it and say the tick is junk. Mm, no, it's not junk. It's trying to tell you it's too hot. New ticks don't white out anymore. The problem with them now is I've heard, oh, my camera whited out. They got moisture on the screen because we haven't been taught that every time we wipe our face piece, the front of your camera has something known as a lens. You need to wipe that because if it gets junk on it, it's just like my glasses, you will not be able to see. Uh, there's many issues with firefighters having problems with batteries staying charged on the camera. We'll address that, but I can tell you that most of the battery issues we create because we don't take care of them. We don't keep the charging contacts clean. We shove them into a trickle charger dirty, and every time it bounces up and down, that's a cycle. And guess what? Thermal imaging camera manufacturer says, you cannot create a memory in a lithium ion battery. Challenge accepted. Guess what the fire service officially did? We created memories in lithium ion batteries. Huh. Glad we were able to do that. Uh, antiquated thermal imaging cameras are currently being used on frontline equipment. So you got the best fire truck, the best gear, best fire station, and you got a 20 year old camera going to search for my kid that can't see further than seven feet. And I can go to Dick's Sporting Goods and buy a better thermal imaging camera with my own money. I think that's a problem. And then obviously a lack of understanding of what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. So let's talk really quickly about how do you measure heat? and why we need to pay attention to what's around us. Watch my bud, good buddy Thomas as he goes in to throw one pallet in his shipping container in his uh, specific training we did for another manufacturer. Look at the back of his shoulders. Watch again in slow motion as he exits the container. Do you think it matters? Look at his shoulders, his face piece, arms, and helmet. There's a reason he's running.
he was in there for seconds. How much protection do you think he really has? And do you think temperature or measuring heat matters? If it affects us that bad, how, do, how much do you think it affects Mrs. Smith, her kid, and her valuables that we supposedly swore to protect? A lot worse than we realize. Here's why this is a problem. These are three cameras that are over 20 years old that are still on frontline apparatus in the United States today. How do I know that? Because I took pictures of them of the departments when I trained them. Is that a problem? Yes. That Bullard MX in the top left-hand corner, you can't hold with one hand. Some of you CrossFit guys who swing 80-pound kettlebells might be able to, but if you hold it straight out, it's a booger. It's like a black and white TV on a stick. It's heavy, okay? And you can't see very far with it. But it was when it was new, it was about 30 grand. That's a problem. And here's the other problem, which we're going to cover tonight. These are brand new cameras. They're situational awareness cameras that are showing up everywhere. And fire departments are throwing away their handheld decision-making cameras and using these instead. The problem with that is, is these have defined limitations and they actually don't work as well as some of those older ones you just saw. We'll talk about which ones are better or worse and why. We're not going to slam manufacturers, but we're going to show you how you can use these to help yourself, help, help Mrs. Smith, help the citizen, and help whoever's in need. So here's your warning. Please don't use outdated technology with modern concepts and expect great results. If you look at the two pictures there, that's a 2001 Scott 160 in the bottom right-hand corner. And if you look at the top, what do you see? You see a brand or a three-year-old camera called a FLIR K65, and it has something called image enhancement. It's four times the resolution of the camera below it, and it can see things you never could see before. It's pretty nice, isn't it? But we hadn't upgraded our stuff because we don't think it's important. Look at the difference between these two. Some of you said you had the Bullard LDX or NXT. This is a Bullard uh, QXT right next to an MSA 5000, which is what my department had until recently. Is there a difference between them two pictures? Huge. It's like going from a console TV to a color TV. You know, you know, one of the new smart TVs. It's a big difference. And we got to keep up, man. I mean, I don't see anybody wanting to go back to a horse-drawn carriage with the steam engine, you know, positive displacement pump. Everybody wants to stay up and go faster and get there quicker and do things more efficiently and effectively. So why aren't we doing that with our technology? Here's a picture on the left of a MSA camera, black and white rollover versus a picture of a video of a rollover and flashover with a camera that was in 2012, I believe. So watch the one on the left. This is on, still on frontline apparatus. This is rollover and grayscale. Watch the picture on the right. This camera's seven or eight years old. A little bit of difference in those two pictures. All it takes is staying up to date with what's going on. Nobody has any problem staying up to date with their cars, their TVs, clothes, and technology, but for some reason we don't want to stay up to date in life-saving measures that can make a difference for us. So let's look at what's next. This is a 360 view, your size-up view of a camera that, that we used in 2011. These are still on frontline apparatus. Tell me how good a picture you think this is. 2011 Scott Eagle attack camera. Do you see much detail? Look at my buddy's helmet as he's carrying around. That's the true definition of a hothead. His helmet's three to 400 degrees, doesn't even know it. Now let's upgrade that a little bit. This next one is a Bullard LDX, I believe, when we were in Canada. Is there a difference between those two images you just saw? Vast. So let's look at some more. This is, this is a Draeger UCF 9000 doing a 360. See that gray moving stuff coming over their head? That's not smoke, that's heat within it. They don't even recognize it. 
So here's the here's the point of all my rambling. Not all cameras are created equal, and all the cameras you just saw are anywhere from 20 years old to as new as three years old. I haven't showed you one that's brand new on the market yet. So let's look at why these cameras are not created equal and why you should understand your tools. Because I'll bet you if I asked you a Halligan bar is a Halligan bar and I handed you a pro bar versus a three piece Halligan, I'd start an argument. Or if I said there's an alkalite ladder versus a dual safety is the same, I might start a heated debate. But yet I'll put a thermal imaging camera in most people's hands and they'll say, yep, it looks like a tick. Yeah, it is. There's a big difference in all of them. We're going to talk about why. So here's your two types of fire service ticks, why you should pay attention. There are two types. There's your situational awareness and decision making. Situational awareness has one purpose, to get you out of a jam. And you can use them for little extras, but in general, they were designed for one reason, to help you find your way out. If you got disoriented or lost, or to keep yourself from becoming disoriented, they helped you locate egress points, locate your crew, or locate the fire. That's what they're for. They're not designed for what decision-making ticks are designed for. They're higher resolution. Decision-making cameras are faster. They have a refresh rate of at least 30 hertz, and they're used for decision-making. 360s, make an entry, line or stream placement, line placement, searches, rapid intervention, and a whole lot more. There's a big difference why, or reason why, you could buy a situational awareness camera for $1,000 or less, but a decision-making camera can cost you anywhere between $3,000 to as much as $15,000. There's a reason behind that. And don't get caught up in the hype. Situational awareness ticks, like your MSA eye tick, is not used for exact temperature ratings, even though the instruction says it can be used for thermography. Thermography is the measurement of heat, the accurate measurement of heat. It uses a seek uh, core in this thing, has a high distance to spot ratio, and can measure accurately in a non-fire environment. When you get in a fire environment with it, how accurate do you think they are? We'll talk about why none of them are accurate in a fire environment. They're not used for size up. They're not used for search or directing hose strength. They are used, as I said, for staying oriented, locating the fire, locating other firefighters, and locating egress points, All right? Don't get caught up in what the salesperson tells you. Do your own homework, okay? Know the difference. A decision-making camera is at least 320 by 240 versus low resolution. Sorry, my dog likes to bark when I teach. So 320 by 240, what does that mean? Well, if you do the math, that's around 80,000 pixels, 76,400 for your math, guys. So why do I want that as my minimum? Because that allows you to see a small child's hand at 15 feet. Does that matter to you? Because if it doesn't, I'd suggest leaving class now because we're all here to make a difference. The lower resolution ticks will only allow you to see a small child's hand at seven feet. Most of your average bedrooms are 12 by 12 or more, and they're getting bigger. Right, some of your re, your uh, decision making cameras are anywhere between 30 hertz to as much as 60 hertz or faster. Your situational awareness cameras are as low as nine hertz. Okay, the NFPA minimum is 25 hertz. Nine hertz, hertz can hurt you, and what that means is one hertz is one frame per second. The human eye sees around 25 hertz. That's why the NFPA minimum is that. If you bought a TV less than 30 hertz, you'd be frustrated because you couldn't watch TV. It would lag or trail, or you'd see frame by frame. So what you want is something that's faster and refreshes the image faster. You want a wide field of view camera. A lot of them are very narrow. And that's pretty cool if you're into photography, you get a narrow field of view, a narrow lens, it allows you to look up close to something really good, almost like a microscope. But we're looking at a big area. We may be looking at a 15 by 30 room, maybe looking down a long hallway, but if we, the more narrow our field of view is, the more we'll have tunnel vision. Here's something that nobody talks about when they buy cameras, the thermal sensitivity of the camera. How sensitive is it to differentiate between an object that is, say, 100 degrees next to a 98.6 degree victim? Why would that be important to you? Anybody want to take a guess or stab at it? Why would that be important? Throw something at me. People or not. Go ahead. What did you say, Scott? You have to be able to find the people. If you can't differentiate, excuse me, if you can't differentiate what's a person and what's an object, uh, what are you doing there? 
Exactly. Thank you. The point of thermal sensitivity is to be able to differentiate between objects of similar temperature. So in a fire, a 98.6 degree victim laying next to a 100 degree pile of clothes is important when you're doing your primary search. It's supposed to be quick, hasty, get to the point. The secondary, the secondary search is supposed to be more thorough. So when you get above 70 millikelvin, which is each millikelvin is a thousandth of a degree, you start seeing less and less. You'll see the fire really well, but you won't see discernible details. You want a camera with a low thermal sensitivity, a very sensitive camera, like me coming off my four day and Rhett coming back to work. I might be a little punchy at the kitchen table. I'm really sensitive, right? We want a camera that has effective temperature range versus just a temperature range. Some of these cameras can go up to 2000 degrees. That doesn't mean they see well up to 2000 degrees. They just measure it. And then you've got cameras that have standard infrared image and you have cameras that have image enhancement. Why should you pay attention to that? It's like the difference between having a regular TV or a 4K TV now that has all the bells and whistles. We can stand in our kitchen now three rooms away and watch TV with my bad eyesight. Why? We've got more pixels. We've got a higher definition, higher resolution. Yet our thermal imaging cameras don't go up to the 320 by 240, which is 76,000 pixels. Why don't you look up the instructions on your TV and see how many pixels you got on your iPhone and your TV. You'll be shocked at how many pixels we have on things we watch every day, but when it comes to looking for a victim, how low the resolution is. So here's some examples of decision-making cameras. I got a picture of a FLIR K65 here looking at the Max Firebox. From the K53 to a K65 is what I would classify as your decision-making camera because it meets the NFPA minimum on your resolution standard. In your Bullard models, it's your LDX, NXT, or QXT. Outside of that, to me, the image is not a high enough quality unless you're getting uh, the exchange program where they rip the guts out, put the new stuff in them because the image is not high, high enough quality for you to see. So those are your top three in that one. Your Draeger users and ones that sent me emails on those, I would stay within the 8,000 or 9,000 because you can see much better with those models. The 6,000 and 7,000 are very low resolution. I classify them the same as a, a situational awareness camera because you can't see very well. Uh, Scott still makes the X380, which hasn't been changed since 2012. Still a decent camera. It was the Cat Daddy when it first came out. It isn't anymore because they haven't done anything with it. Um, the Leader 3.1, 3.3, or 4.1 is a good decision-making camera for a lower price point. Your Argus users, your MyTick, whether you're in the E or the S category, that's a good decision-making camera. And then the MSA 6000. So those of you said you use FLIR, I think somebody put they used a K4045, uh, not as prevalent as the other models. You want to stay upwards in the, I'd say, K33, K53, and up. K33 is less resolution, but it still has image enhancement. You want K53 and up because you'll be able to see better at longer distance. You'll notice that when we list these stats on these uh, wonderful little cheat sheets here, which I will make this video available to you at the end, if anybody wants to watch the recording, I'll have it processed maybe in a day or two. You notice the field of view of these cameras are much wider on the horizontal, the left to right, which allows you to see a bigger room better. Plus we teach what we call the gangster grip. We flip the camera so you can see floor to ceiling in one shot. The majority of cameras out there have, like this one have high and low sensitivity or two temperature modes because when they see significant heat, they have to switch. This one switches when it sees 18% of the overall field of view is around 300 degrees. Okay, and it has something known as image enhancement or FSX. That's where it's a game changer between the other cameras because you're able to see things you couldn't normally see before. It's like edge definition. It outlines the edges of objects behind the flames, which allows you, if there's a flame front in front of a bed, it allows you to see a closet door behind it. it, allows you to see possibly a victim behind it. I'll show you picture after picture and video of it. Don't believe me. Believe what you see in a fire. This one has a refresh rate of 60 hertz, pretty fast. It is not intrinsically safe as far as the K33 through the K55 models. You buy the K65, it meets the NFPA standard. The locking screw on the bottom is the difference, and they also paid the money to have the NFPA 1801 certification tested. And the majority of them from K33 up offer a picture or video recording. I highly recommend that. Uh, the K53 is one of my favorites because it's one button record and I go to work. Uh, those of you who have these, they're really simple to operate if you have the K55 and up. I don't like multi-button cameras, but this is one that gives you an example of it. 
The green button's always the power button on newer cameras. The center button's your application modes. I'll show you why you don't want to stray too far in there. And there, for some reason, they like Zoom. I don't really like Zoom because I don't have time to play with buttons in a fire. Um, here's your cheat sheet on this. This comes from FLIR, but if you notice, I circled two things on here. The top left corner where it says number five is your TI basic mode. That is your standard color palette that, that NFPA has adopted. It's very simple, black, gray, white, yellow, orange, red. That is how your color should progress from cold to hot. Anything outside of that is lots of bells and whistles, and it's probably designed for another environment. I'll tell you why. As you look at number four and number three options, number four is all grayscale. Not a big grayscale fan, and here's why. The human eye can only differentiate 30 shades of gray, not 50 like the movie, okay? And that's the average female. The average male can differentiate 10 shades of gray. This is why I'm not allowed to pick out colors in Lowe's, okay? Number three is a fire mode designed for Bullard users because it doesn't kick in color till 500 degrees. The NFPA standard and the one that FLIR uses kicks in color at 300 degrees Fahrenheit. In this picture, it's in Celsius, so bear with me on that one. The bottom two are in blue. There's a reason for that. Green is for fire and blue is for search. I would not use those for searching in a fire. Here's why. I fussed at manufacturers about this, because anytime you tell a firefighter search, they think I'm searching in a fire. If you use the option two, which is search and rescue mode, they think they can use it in fire and search and rescue mode. Problem with that is, is that mode's dynamic range or temperature range maxes out at 300 degrees. Are you gonna go into a fire that's gonna be above 300 degrees? Yes. So what happens when you see greater than 300 degrees when you're in search and rescue mode? You will see nothing but a big red blob. I've watched video after video on YouTube and I've done it myself with my own camera going into a fire and put that in that search and rescue mode. And the minute I got into a high temperature environment, I lost all discernible detail and I was, I might as well have been blind. Okay. Option one, heat detection mode is a great mode for using for, they call you in the middle of the night, smell something burning in the house, but can't, don't have any visible smoke or fire. It, it outlines anything that's hot in red. It's not really color temperature correlative. It just makes it red. So it helps you see the difference. Okay. Clear uses a very simple color palette. Like I said, it's the TI basic color palette. This is our cheat sheet. We did this so firefighters would pay attention. If you see yellow when you're driving down the road and the green light changes to yellow, we're supposed to slow down, not speed up. But just like we do on the road, we tend to speed up. What I want you to speed up is speed up the water to that yellow. Anything gray or white moving or that yellow, get rid of it. Because once you get outside of yellow and get into orange, you're exceeding the limitations of your PPE. So if you're exceeding the limitations of your PPE, you're pretty much exceeding the limitations of survivability for those victims if they're in that flow path or in that fire room. So you're doing them no good by waiting. So you need to kill that heat where you're at and kill it where you're going and get those gases and heat off the victim. So if you see yellow or gray moving fast stuff, you want to get rid of it. If you see orange and red, you're in a bad place because look at your temperature ranges. Okay, this is a cheat sheet we use when we burn with the max firebox. In about 20 minutes, we can teach a student how to interpret the image with the Max Firebox because the Max Firebox has a lot of attributes that are really neat. It's not a, just a dollhouse, it's a 350 pound block of steel and it's a machine. Okay, if you hadn't used one, I highly recommend it. But the inside of it is burning with OSB. So when we look at the products of combustion coming out of it, we'll see the gray convection currents, we'll see the colorization from yellow to red so we can do our simulation if we're trying to find the fire, we're going from convection currents, swimming upstream and finding the fire, seeing the heat inside the box. You can look at the right side of the box as diamond plating, and you can use the camera for an emiss emissivity demonstration. I can show you why emissivity is important, because if you look at the shiny side of that box when it's rocking hot, it will tell you that the side of that box is average temperature, whatever it is outside, and that can fool you, okay? You don't want to try to measure shiny surfaces with a fire service tick. I'll show you a cheat sheet in the uh, notes that shows if it says it's 150 degrees on a lo low emissivity object, it's actually around 450 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And any fire service tick that is 2008 or newer will have this upper left corner will have a green triangle. You'll notice it shows up there. You should pay attention to that because that means everything in front of you is around 300 degrees at least at least, because what it did is it changed the aperture of the lens 
closed it down to focus in on the heat so it doesn't burn up the detector. Here's our cheat sheet. If you're looking into a fire, this is one of our burns. Notice the difference with the image enhancement and how crisp their helmets are. Yes, someone's wearing a European helmet. Don't call me out on it. We wear all kinds of cool stuff. As my friend Thomas says, I've done a lot of cool stuff and dumb stuff in the name of science. So, um, and the funny thing is the guy from Australia is wearing a uh, leather helmet over there. So that's kind of neat. But you notice the edge definition in here. I, you can see the corners of the Connex box. You can see through the flames and the, and the chains and the OSB hanging from the ceiling. That is image enhancement. If you use the cheat sheet here, you can see that yellow is three to 500 degrees, orange is six to 800, red is 900, 1200 degrees. It's a bad day. We're just sitting there looking at it. And this was zero visibility. And here's a real life demonstration of it. Notice the image on the left and the image on the right. The one on the left is a GoPro, the one on the right is your FLIR camera. Notice what you don't see with the GoPro, but what you see with the FLIR. You're looking inside, you see it's in low sense mode, you've got radiant feedback hitting the ceiling, you've got a thermal column, you've got heat moving across from the fire, across the couch, and the couch is starting to light up, not on fire per se on the whole couch, but it's beginning to off gas. I was never to, taught to cool furniture. This is why you'd want to cool it, because what's happening in that couch? It's off gassing. Is that a good thing? No. Everybody told me, don't crawl past fire. Nobody told me, don't crawl past superheated fuels or heat. Notice that yellow dog pee looking stuff heading your way. Yeah, Joey's one of my instructors there. He's a good dude. He's, he's the one that did it. See the heat coming towards the door? Watch the carpet in the, in the GoPro shot here in the next few seconds. You'll see the thermal view, it'll start to pull. It'll actually pull the carpet. Watch, look, the carpet's pulling away from the door. That's how much heat is in that room. And yet, I would have waited to open the nozzle the way I thought originally. Not now. I'm gonna see the enemy and take care of it, okay? So, when you, those of you who said you use the Draeger camera, got you some quick cheat sheets here. The majority of uh, the Draeger cameras are NFPA 1801 certified. Uh, unfortunately, this is a false statement by the manufacturer because they're certified by the 2012 standard. There's an 2018 and they got to meet it. So what you need to pay attention to is what standard did they get certified to and when? Because it changes over time. All of them are intrinsically safe, which means they won't create an ignition source in a hazmat methyl ethyl death environment. And they can see from negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 1800 degrees. That's pretty impressive. Drager also records audio. You hear me? It records audio. When you're doing training, do not say things you shouldn't because they will play it back and remind you. Hint, hint. Okay. Well, guys, make sure you mute your microphones if you just joined. Uh, notice that in this one, in the Max Firebox, you can see when the camera's in low sense mode, anything that's yellow is 570 degrees. You want to wait till you see color with this camera? No, sir, or no, ma'am. Because when you see color, it's too late. 570 degrees is outside the limitation of your face piece, your gloves, and your hose line. And your radio fails at 320. I think you don't want to wait that long. Here's your key for your trigger. In the upper left hand corner, you got a green triangle, which is telling you it's in low sensitivity mode. You can see the spot temperature measurement, which says it's 39 degrees Celsius. This is why we don't trust the spot temperature, because the spot temperature is a predetermined spot measurement at a predetermined depth. And that measurement can vary depending on what you point at and can be way outside of the limitation or way outside of what's actually in that room. As you can see in this room, it's a lot hotter than 39 degrees Celsius. So some of you said you used the Scott X3. You wanna pay attention to this one because this one was made a few years ago, but it's still a pretty impressive camera. We see from negative 40 to 2,000 degrees. Okay. You're not sure why. Hey, if you got your cam, your uh, your uh, iPhone or your thing not muted, please mute it for me, please. Too late to what? Hey, Michael, can you hear me? Okay, you don't have time to see it. Yes. Can you mute your phone for me, buddy? I am so sorry. No problem. All right. So when we're looking at the uh, Scott X380, you've got a pretty high range you can see, but it also breaks the temperature down or the temperature range into three temperature modes, high, medium, and low. Eh, 
that's where it get a little sketchy with this one. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to memorize three different color palettes and three different temperature ranges at three in the morning. It's very difficult to uh, gauge, I'll put it that way. It does have some of the higher resolution on the market. It's 384 by 288 or 110,000 pixels. It's 60 hertz, it's fast, has one of the highest distance to spot ratios on the market, and the X380N is intrinsically safe. Unfortunately, Scott hasn't done anything with it since they bought it in 2012. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of customer service issues. Um, used to be one of my favorite cameras, but nonetheless. So here's what it looks like moving into a fire. You look into this fire room, you would see gray. You would think it was cool. Unfortunately, in low sense mode with the, the ISG, gray and white is approaching 600 degrees. And I would look at that floor and think, oh, that's cool. I can crawl across that. Well, you can. But it's going to get real hot real fast because yellow is 600 to 800. Orange is 800 to 1,000, and red is anywhere between 1,200 and 2,000 degrees. That's a pretty wide range. And you have to pay attention to that symbol in the upper left-hand corner if it's in high, medium, or low sense, because that tells you where you're at temperature-wise. Here's your cheat sheet for that. Notice that little dotted line I put across the middle of the room? That is known as the thermal layer. A lot of us, including myself, have taught, watch out for that descending thermal layer. It's like a broiler. It's heating up everything in the room, including you and the victim and the furniture. The problem with trying to look for the thermal layer is depending on the manufacturer, the thermal layer can vary. In this one, the thermal layer varies based on which temperature mode you're in. If it's in high, medium, or low, it can be in three different places. If you're using a particular camera that doesn't show colorization to 1,000 degrees, you may not see the thermal layer at all until it's too late. So you better pay attention to your camera and know it. In this case, we can see the fire locations to our right, we can see that thermal layer is 50% of the space, which is a bad day. That means everything in the room is about to light off. This picture was taken about five or six seconds before the room flashed over. And here's one of the reasons I don't like tri-mode sensitivity. Which image to you looks worse? The one on the left or the one on the right? Because most would think it'd be the one on the left, but it's in medium sense mode. That's the middle range, three to 500 plus degrees. When this camera sees over 450, overall it switches to low sense. Notice when it switches to low sense, look real close with me here. I'll draw you a little line. Notice you don't see anything below this red line in low sense mode. But over here, I can see a lot of detail. Okay, that's the camera adjusting to the heat. Just like if you go from a dark room and your pupil is dilated, it sees light, it constricts. And it sees the light really well, but guess what? It doesn't see a lot of detail outside of that. You want to do a neat little experiment and make somebody mad, and you go back to the fire station, have three of your guys sit in a recliner in the dark. One of them in the center has a light, and he's, he turns it on and points at another guy across the room. The guy across the room will go from seeing three guys in the dark to seeing a bright light and none of them. That's the difference between high sensitivity and low sensitivity. High sensitivity to detail in the darker, cooler environment is how we'll translate it. And when it goes to high heat or bright light, we see the threat or the light, but we don't see anything else. And I'll give you a couple examples. This is high and medium sensitivity. And then look at this. This is the full video. We're burning real fuels. We don't do strong pallets in our research burns. Camera's already in mini medium sense mode. Look at the great uh, scale moving across the ceiling and cutting across the top of that threshold. See the yellow already forming? That's 300 plus degrees in that room. As it goes into the next room, it cools as it mixes with those gases and it starts to heat up that next room, little by little. And it's not for every one minute you leave it unchecked, it doubles in size and intensity. It's for every 18 degrees squared, it doubles in size and intensity in air entrainment. And that's not my numbers, that's Dr. John L. Bryan's. Look it up because he learned how to do that burning real fuels and he's the one that built fire protection extinguishing systems and he's the reason why you have a certain distance between your sprinkler heads. He's the one that figured that out. Notice the descending thermal layer. You're at medium sense mode. Watch what happens when this thing switches to low sense. Boom. Hey, where'd my color go? Boom. There it is. I changed my focal point. Came back. Now it looks really bad. When it goes to low sense, I lose that and you get fooled by it because we don't know our camera. One really cool feature about this camera though, those of you who have it, and a lot of people don't use it, that's why I want to show you this, is called the cold spot tracker. 
How many of you were trained to look for a victim in cold smoke? Because all my department did for years, we do search training and we use fake smoke. What's the problem with training in fake smoke? Somebody want to help me out? What's the problem with training in fake smoke to search for a victim? Anybody? There's too much of a temperature differentiation that isn't really there. Oh, exactly. It's not, it's not much of a temperature differentiation. Not too much. If I'm in cold smoke and you're 98.6 degrees and I look at you with a tick, what are you going to look like with a tick in cold smoke? Anybody? You're going to be white hot. Is a 98.6 degree victim going to be white hot in a fire? No. Watch this. This is the guy who got me started in thermal imaging. He used to own this company, not Scott, but ISG. He buried himself under some pallets after we burned this room. They're going to turn this camera on cold spot tracker. Watch really closely. It goes from hot spot tracker to cold spot. It's, it's locating something cold under those pallets. What does a firefighter wear that stays cold all the time, especially if you're a heavy breather like me? An SCBA cylinder. You see Mr. Mr. Uh, Bobby Kyle now? Yeah. That's why a cold spot tracker is important because you're going to find a downed firefighter or a victim or those of you who've had the misfortune of going into a hoarding environment, it will find the pathway because the pathway is the shielded insulated path. It's not just heat. We need to know the whole environment. Some of you said you had the Argus camera. There's two different types currently. There's the Argus MyTIC E and MyTIC S. E stands for economy, in my opinion. It's the cheaper version of the S, but to me, I would buy this one just because there's not much difference between it and the S. The S has a larger screen, but I don't need a 2,000 degree range when this one only goes up to 1,400 degrees. A good camera for the money, one of the things that they did I thought was really smart was we like to break things. They made it really durable. Uh, Bullard and Argus probably make the toughest housing out there. But one thing they did that was really smart was we like to break the germanium window. If you notice in the front of the camera, when I told you you need to learn to wipe the camera, or wipe the lens, this is the germanium window. Germanium is a thin piece of metal. It allows infrared energy to go through. This is the eyesight or the optical system of the camera. If this gets clogged with crud and moisture, it can't see. But they made it really wide so you could wipe it with a gloved hand. They also did something else that was really unique. If you break your germanium window on the majority of fire service ticks, you have to spend a lot of money, send it back, and get it repaired. The Argus one, you can spend $200 and pull out eight screws and change it yourself. Which one would you rather do in the, in the day of budgetary constraints? Definitely want to save a little money nowadays. So this camera has tri-mode sensitivity. I told you I'm not a big fan of that, but the one thing they did differently, I thought was pretty smart, was they don't change the temperature bar. It just says zero to 2,000 degrees, which is, that's the range. Never changes. What changes is that little triangle in the upper left-hand corner. This is the part that gets a little confusing. If you don't see a triangle, you're in high sensitivity mode, zero to 300 degrees. You can stay high, as my friend Joe DeVito says. When you see that triangle, you need to stay low and you need to be flowing. Because in front of you is at least 300 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> you can like a phone camera, buddy. Like no. Thank you, buddy. So when that camera shows you that triangle, you're in low sensitivity mode. Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. The first triangle is green. The second triangle is red. That means everything in front of you is at least 500 degrees. You don't want to wait that long. Uh, all of their cameras are intrinsically safe, which I thought was a smart move on their part because they're all NFPA certified. Anybody have any questions so far? Anybody at all? Let me get this little annotation thing off of here and we'll move to the next one. This is the only thing I don't like about Zoom is the mouse will go away sometimes. And then you have to figure it out. Bear with me one second. 
All right, there we go. So if you have a fire with the Argus camera, this is what it'll look like. These are two firefighters in a burn we did in uh, Shelby. They're about to make entry. You notice you see the yellow coming through that old door and the gray and white convection currents. Yellow's three to 500 degrees. They follow the same color palette, the TI basic color palette that FLIR does. I believe that's the simplest, easiest to understand because you don't want to wait to show colorization with firefighters today because we don't respond to grayscale despite what thermographers think. There's a big disconnect between engineering and human behavior. They think it works this way, but then they don't study the context of what the environment the firefighters function in and realize we don't have time to do that. Here's your thing. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Dan. One of the things that you, he's making a lot of points fast, and one of the things that's important to understand, as you move to tactically using the tick for uh, putting out fire, not just looking for looking for somebody, your your information that you're getting tonight is going to be extremely valuable because you're you're actually making decisions on heat reference to the attack, not just the search. So I just want to make the importance of where you are in your learning curve sometimes affects what you listen to. Yeah. And like I said, we're covering a lot of information really fast and we're going to get into more of it, but all this is available to you after it's over. Cause I want you to be able to digest this a little bit more slowly. And as uh, chief Scott was asking at the beginning, I'll give you all access to the Dropbox folder so you can go as deep in the weeds as you want. Ask my buddy, Jake, he's, he's going pretty deep in it right now. Just, I will warn you if you have a slight interest in it, don't open the box unless you're really interested because yeah, when, when you figure these things out, you, you can't stop learning. It's pretty, pretty amazing to me because I thought I knew a little bit about thermal imaging and then I got hurt and went to school for it. And when I went to school for it, I was hooked because then I realized what I don't know. I don't know a lot and I still don't know. And I keep wanting to learn. So this is your cheat sheet for your Argus. And if you look at this, this is how I broke it down for you. High sense mode is zero to 300 degrees. Low sense mode, the first one is three to 750. And extended low is 750 to 2000 degrees. Why do we need to measure that hot? I think we can melt aluminum at like 1200. You know, our mass fails at 350. Why do I need to go up to 2000 degrees? I'm not really sure why they've done that. So here's your quick video of what this camera looks like. Notice that the green triangle is engaged in the lower left corner. This is an Argus My 320. This is a KTF burn where in Kill the Flashover, they did a hoarding research burn. This is the one I got uh, hurt at that year, so I couldn't quite attend it. And if you look really closely, you can see the convection currents coming over the, the top of the porch. Notice when we, we zoom in on the door, you see the yellow coming out. Let me go back to the door. There you go. Look at that. There's a lot of heat come over the piles of stuff that we piled in that house. Loaded at about 10,000 cubic feet of stuff in there. Notice real quick with me that when the camera changed from right, I'll back it up, right there. That's in low sense mode, the green triangle. Watch really closely, boom. Now what color is that triangle? Red. Hmm, how easy would it be to miss that? The overall field of view got a lot hotter and the camera picked it up we'd miss that if we scan too quick. So some of you said you use the Bullard. Uh, I put several of the Bullards in here. This is a quick cheat sheet. We also sell a, a tick guide for those of you who are really into it. We have 34 different models of cameras covered in that. The Bullard NXT or QXT has image enhancement like the FLIR cameras, allows you to see the edges of things really well. If you notice in the picture, you'll see in the lower left-hand corner, you can actually see the outline of the furniture and the objects in the room. Uh, the, the field of view is pretty narrow, but the camera itself produces a good image. It really comes down to a lot of people like pistol grip versus flashlight style cameras. I mean, that's personal preference and ergonomics. It's a fast camera at 60 hertz, has one of the better distance spot ratios, 57 to 1. And the way we explain that to firefighters is, would you rather be a pocket knife assassin or a long range sniper when you're facing a big enemy? You want a camera that can see the enemy far off. That means this camera can see the enemy measure heat effectively 57 feet away it can measure a one foot square okay and the nxt is nfpa compliant which is good some of you said you had the ldx very similar not quite as pretty a picture from my experience it claims it will be makes it in two different models uh the distance to spot ratio is a little less 
It's got a very low thermal sensitivity, which is good, but it's not intrinsically safe. So you don't want to carry this into a methyl ethyl bad stuff environment. And here's the other thing about Bullard. They haven't changed their color palette in 15 years. This is where I argue with them a little bit. They don't show any color till 500 degrees. That's too late in our environment, ladies and gentlemen. When you're looking at our PPE and the contents in our home that start off gassing at 200 degrees, it's too late. And firefighters don't respond to grayscale. I'll show you why. This is one of their better images that we made a cheat sheet out of. Got your burn barrel and you can see the studs in the wall. You see the green triangle. We put some little breakdowns of the actual colorization and the heat in the room. The problem is, is if I put this camera next to a FLIR and next to a Draeger, they're all gonna show that thermal layer at a different height based on when that camera shows color at what temperature. That's why it's important for you to know your camera. It's like Rick Glasky when he had, tells that story about my saw. I'll go get my saw, it'll crank chief. Well, if you know your tick, I don't have to tell you what's bad and what's not. Our job is to interpret that image and act accordingly. So we covered a lot with the decision-making cameras. We're almost one hour in. Before we start hammering the situational awareness cameras, let's take about five minutes and uh, go flow some water, force some doors to the bathroom, all that stuff. Everybody good?